we're up to Mishnah number, we're up to chapter six, Mishnah number six. This is a very unusual Mishnah because it's known as the 48 Ways to Wisdom. And we're not going to do this Mishnah in one sitting, in one series, because there's so much here. Uh, Gedola Torah. Let's read this uh, Mishnah just a little bit, and then uh, we'll explain what we'll do here. Gedola Torah, Yosem and Akuna. Torah is greater, even more than priesthood. Umin HaMalchus and monarchy. Shehamalchus nicknames Bishloshim Malos, because royalty, because monarchy is acquired with 30 miles, with 30 levels. Fahakuhuna and the priesthood, nicknames Be'esrim Va'arba, is acquired with 24 qualities. Ve'hatora nicknames Ba'arbaim Ushmona Dvarim. And Torah is acquired with 48 themes. So this is the famous Mishnah, maybe the most famous Mishnah in the entire book, the 48 ways to Torah. There's 48 different ways to acquire Torah. And because this is so fundamental, you know, this is really our aspirational life. How, how do we acquire what the Almighty wants to give us? He wants to give us this amazing gift. What do we need to do to acquire it? We're told there are 48 different things we need to do. And in order to not just run through them, in order to have them impact us, we'll try to go through them one at a time. And the first way is Betalmud, way number one, and that is through study. Before we begin to understand what these 48 ways are individually and what it means specifically to study, let's talk about this very interesting concept of 48 ways to acquire Torah. So first of all, this tells us that Torah needs to be acquired. The Hebrew word here being used is Torah nikneis, the word kinyan, which means to acquire. This term is found all over the Talmud to refer to a method of acquiring something. If you want to have a transaction between two parties, you have to confer ownership. You have to confer the title, the deed, how one asset is conveyed from its current owner to the buyer. It's done via what's called a kinyan, a title transfer. It's acquired, and the ownership rights are from entity A to entity B. Torah, we're told, needs to be acquired. It is insufficient to just study Torah. It has to become yours. And what this means is, is that the Torah, you know, who's the current owner of Torah? The answer is, of course, it's God. The roots of the Torah are in heaven. And it's not just enough to study Torah. You have to acquire it. You have to make it yours. The Almighty gives it to us, but we have to acquire it via a means of title transfer, a means of acquisition, and the 48 ways to acquire Torah are featured in this Mishnah. The Almighty avails Torah for us. He is willing to confer it to us, but there are things that we need to do if we want to make it ours. The Torah is the Almighty's Torah. Through these 48 ways, it becomes ours, and that's the goal. The Talmud tells us that if a father who a child needs to honor, right? You have to honor your father and mother. It's part of the Ten Commandments. If a father says, you know what? You don't need to honor me. I'm forgiving. I'm willing to overlook slights to my honor. Is he entitled to do that? The answer is yes. Why? Because the child has to honor him. If the person who is the recipient of that right wants to forego that right, all the power to them. They are entitled to forego that right. But what about a Torah sage? A Torah sage, well, you have to honor them as well. Can they forego that honor? Can they for Go the honor that is due to them as a Torah sage. So the Talmud, the book of Kiddushin, page 32a and b, brings a dispute. According to one opinion, they cannot. You're honoring not them, you're honoring the Torah. And therefore, if they want to forego their honor, it doesn't matter. It's not their honor, it's the Torah's honor. 
comes along Rav Yosef. And he says, no. If a Torah scholar wants to forego their honor, they may do so. Why? Because they become the owner of that Torah. And it quotes a beautiful verse. Ki im betoras Hashem chevzo, u betoras so yehegye yomam velayla. It's talking about a Torah scholar who is desirous of the Torah of Hashem. Betoras Hashem chevzo, they are desirous of the Torah of Hashem. U betoras so, and in their Torah, they study day and night. So the Talmud's saying, wait a minute, who owns the Torah? It starts off by saying that a Torah scholar is desirous of God's Torah. And then it says, well, they study their Torah day and night. Which is it? Who is the owner? Explains the Talmud. In the beginning, it starts off as God's Torah. And once you study it and you review it, you acquire it and it becomes your Torah. You become the owner of that Torah. And because it's yours, you can forego the honor that is rightfully due to you. That's the idea of the methods of acquiring the Torah. We have access to Torah. We can study Torah. And that's wonderful. But there is a level of connection to Torah where it's not just you're studying the Almighty's Torah. You have acquired the Almighty's Torah and now it's your Torah. How is that done? How is that higher level connection to Torah? 48 different ways. And this very unique Mishnah is going to delineate the 48 ways to acquire Torah. There is a ubiquitous custom to study these 48 ways in the period of the year that we're actually in right now, namely the days between Pesach and Shavuos. When the nation left Egypt, they left Egypt and they started their march towards Sinai. And at Sinai, they got the Torah. How many days were there between Exodus to to Sinai? Of course, we know. We count 49 days between when we left and when we finally got the Torah at Sinai. And that's the counting of the Omer. So there is a custom to spend 48 days each day studying, ruminating, and trying to connect with one of these ways of acquiring Torah. And thus you have uh, 48 days of preparation. And the 49th day, the day before Shavuos, you review it all. That's that's one uh, way to explain it. Others say, well, no, the 49th day, you got to take a nap. You don't want to cram before the test. Uh, others say, well, no, day one, you have to prepare yourself for it. And only the subsequent 48 days do you actually study one of them. But general, this idea is well accepted that... There's this custom to get ready for Torah via focusing on the ways to acquire Torah. Now, the commentaries disagree as to whether or not you need all 48 to have Torah. And thus, your your conquest of Torah is incomplete unless you have all 48 ways. Or is each one of them on their own sufficient? And the answer is probably somewhere in between that each method to acquire it deepens the connection and the ownership that you have over Torah. So, for example, the, the Gon of Vilna in the book of Proverbs, in this great commentary to the book of Mishli, Proverbs, in chapter 31, verse 29, this is part of the famous Eishes Chayel part of Proverbs. The verse says, Rabos Banos Asu Chayel. Lots of girls made war. What does that mean? Lots of women made war. The word chayel means war. And the gematria, the word chayel, well, the ches is eight, and the yud is 10, so that's 18, and the lamed is 30, so the total of this word chayel is 48. So the Gona Vilna's commentary says, lots of girls acquire chayel or make war, meaning you need a lot of people to have all 48. Because all of Torah and the ownership of all of Torah is found in these 48 ways, but no single individual can have them all. 
you know, some have these, some have a connection to these methods of acquiring, and some have a connection to other ones of the 48 ways, but no individual has them all. You need robbers, but lots of girls, so to speak. This is, again, on, on a proverbial, literally proverbial level, you need a lot of different people to have all 48 ways. Collectively, we have all 48 ways, and collectively, we all have Torah, but no individual can be completely adorned with the crown of all 48 ways. That's one way to look at it. But regardless, the more connections that we have to these 48 ways of conquering Torah, the greater our capacity is to acquire and to integrate the connection that we are supposed to have with Torah. Now, of course, like many lessons in Torah, they are very valuable for spiritual pursuits. After all, you want Torah, you want to acquire Torah, not just to study, you want to have it, to own it, this is what you need to do. But they're also applicable more broadly. Like all of the lessons that we have in Torah, they can be used in other areas, in non-sacred areas of our life as well. So let's begin to understand the general idea here. You know, the Mishnah contrasts Torah with the two other crowns that we have in our nation. There are three crowns, the crown of the priesthood. And if you're not a Kohen, this is a crown that you will never be able to have access to. And then there's the crown of the monarchy. And unless you are an heir of David, you can't can't become a king. That's it. That's limited to that one family alone. But the crown of Torah is available for anyone who wants to come claim it. And this is the mission we've had earlier in, in Perky Avos. This is the idea of the three crowns in the Mishkan and the tabernacle. The crown around the ark symbolizes Torah. Around the table symbolizes the monarchy. And around the altar symbolizes the other crown, the crown of priesthood. But the way the Mishnah contrasts them is as well, there are, there are 30 aspects of the crown of the crown of the monarchy. And there are 24 aspects of the crown of priesthood. But there are 48 ways to acquire Torah. Now, what are these 30 things, 24 things of the monarchy and the priesthood respectively? So that's not mentioned in our Mishnah. Maybe because, you know, unless you you either have it or you don't have it. But the answer is that there are 24 privileges that the Kohen has. And there are 30 different elements of law related to a Kohen. And therefore, there are, because there are 24 rights that the Kohen has, it must be that the priesthood is combined of 24 different aspects. But if you think about this, this Mishnah, it doesn't seem to be along the same lines. When we're talking about Torah, it's what you need to do to acquire Torah. When we're talking about priesthood, it's what you have after you are a priest. It's not the means of acquiring the priesthood. It is the results, the the rights, the privileges that a Kohen has. Similarly with, with kingdom, with the monarchy. It's talking about once you are a king, there are 30 different aspects of Jewish law that are pertinent to you alone. So it seems to be a little bit, you know, uh, asymmetric. With respect to Torah, it's not about how you acquire Torah. With respect to the other two, it's like once you have it, what what do you have? And the way to reconcile this is to understand what it means by acquiring Torah. There are 48 different privileges that come with Torah. And when Aaron conquered the priesthood, he did it because he acquired it in 24 different ways. And how do we know that Aaron acquired the priesthood in 28 different ways? By the fact that there are 24 different rites associated with the Kohen. Similarly, David, how did he get the priesthood? How did he get the monarchy? We don't know. But we know for sure that there were 30 different things that he did, 30 different qualities that he acquired. Why? As evidenced by the fact that there are 30 different elements of what he acquired. Thus, you could prove either from the upstream or the downstream, as they say here in Texas, from various different elements of the process, you know for sure what went into it. Because if you look at the result, you can know that the mirror effect of that is what were the inputs. The inputs are always going to mirror the outputs. 
And therefore, by the fact that we see that there are 24 different elements of the priesthood and 30 elements of the kingdom, it must be that they were acquired with 30 and 24 respectively. Similarly, there are, there are 48 different ways to acquire, and therefore there are 48 different levels of greatness associated with Torah. But unlike the priesthood and unlike kingship, this crown is not granted exclusivity. If you're from the tribe of Levi, from the bloodline of Aaron, you are a Kohen. Otherwise, you're out of luck. Maybe beforehand, the emotion was destined to be the Kohen. He lost it. Aaron got it. Before this family was selected, maybe you had a chance. Now it's too late. David was selected. They, there may have been other candidates beforehand. But now David was selected too late. Torah, the most prestigious and largest crown of them all, is still accessible to all of them. And each one of these 48 ways un unlocks for us another realm of Torah that was previously unattainable. So let's begin. Way number one, Bitalmud with study. I think this is the most intuitive of the ways to acquire Torah. Because to get Torah, you need to study it. If you don't study Torah, of course you won't have Torah. To me, this makes the most sense. Now, I am reminded of a comment of Rabbeinu Yonah all the way back in chapter one of the book of the ethics of our fathers of Pekiravos. He's talking about the imperative to study Torah and to always increase our study. And I read it again recently and I was reminded of the very strong language that he, that he does. He's talking about someone who does not study Torah. And the Mishnah says, this is one of the Mishnahs of, uh, of Hillel in chapter 1. Udalo Yalev Katalachai, if someone who does not study Torah, is liable to be killed. Really, st really strong, harsh language in the Mishnah. Explains, Rabbeinu Yonah, Mi Shalom Lama Kral if someone does not study at all, Nimshal Kibahema, is really similar to an animal. Why were you created in the world? Achla haben lahoros b'Torah to understand how you're supposed to live. V'zeh shelo asa b'Torah kol yamav. Someone does not learn about the manual for living. Ve'odena machzi b'roshaso, and he's still living as as a wicked person. Ain raui lichios afil yomecham afil shachas. Is not worthy to live even for one day, even for one hour. I was thinking, you know animals really don't have any any new technology since you know 2500 years ago they kind of do the same thing chewing the same grass producing the same milk they look the same the style hasn't changed it's the same thing they're, they're static and this is who they are the nice thing about animals is that that they don't change they stay the way they are humanity if we were to do that we would invariably dip. If we don't improve, if there's no dynamism and progress, then we become more and more barbaric. And the only way thus to, to stop, to make us not be like animals and to make us be constantly improving is if we have manuals, if we have ways to improve ourselves. And thus, someone who does not want to take the Almighty's instructions, how to live a good life, how to live a righteous life, well, to a certain extent, they're like an animal. And what, what are you doing here if you're a human granted with the ability to improve and become great and you don't do that, really, you're supposed to be dead. You are squandering life. And even someone who has learned, they have to always study even more. Udalomo sif yisaf. Someone does not increase their study. They remain stagnant. They too have no portion, or they deserve no portion in life. This is the words of Rabbi Yonah, very, very harsh language here. He wrote, so may be the will of God, that this person should die. <laughs> Again, very, very harsh language. If you're a human, you're here to improve. And the second you, you turn off the gas and take a foot off the, off the pedal and you get stagnant, 
you have lost your claim on life. So I'm thinking, you know, this is this is really important. This is what we're here for. Animals, they have no dynamism, there's no learning, there's no cooperation, there's no ethics, there's no morals. If you don't learn, if you don't study, if you don't change, to a certain degree, you are like an animal. And we have Torah, and we need to study it. Now, the word used to describe study here is Talmud, which, of course, we know there's a whole set of books of Talmud published today in 73 volumes. Not something you can finish in an afternoon. Even a summer afternoon. When we say Talmud, we're referring not just to simple learning, but to advanced learning. You know, this is not a Jewish idea, but Christians have a thing where they say, oh, this is my favorite passage, favorite verse in the Torah. If you read verses, you're studying scripture, but that's not Talmud. You read the Talmud, and there's no just low-level grazing the surface, shallow learning, or just reading verses. It's about going as deep as you possibly can on every subject. It means means to work out your brain, to push your brain to the absolute maximum to understand what Hashem wants. This is the kind of study that we did in Yeshiva. There's nothing basic about it. There's nothing rudimentary. There's no surface learning, nothing shallow, as deep as you possibly can. And you're working through the problems, and you're studying, and you're analyzing, and you're thinking until you try to understand it completely to the best of your abilities. In yeshiva, you could spend legitimately weeks and months on a single page of Talmud. One page! One page! That's how much depth that there is there. And it's not just you're not just drinking coffee and, you know, playing bear punk. It's not what happens in yeshiva. 10 hours, 15 hours a day, toiling. These are very bright people, I assure you. What are they doing? They're doing Talmud. That's what they're doing. They're starting at a very high level, the highest level of thinking, pushing yourself to the limits of your capacities, thinking until your brain hurts, or at least least testing the limits of what you're able to Access. By the way, this is one of the most pleasurable and sublime experiences a human can have in this world. Anything physical or carnal doesn't match. Doesn't match. The pleasure of of the intellectual pursuit of something so deep and so unfathomably deep, and you really work your way and sweat your way until until you arrive at the destination, Nothing can match that. But of course, the, the problem is the payoff is delayed. You start off and you, all you have is a page of text. And you don't know exactly where the, the points of entrance to the depths of the subject matter, where they are. You got to read it, understand it on a very basic level. What's the question? What's the answer? What's the proof? What's the evidence? Does it all make sense? Does it all check out? Look at the commentaries, look at Rashi. Why is he saying this, not that? Why is he focusing on this point, not that? Why is he omitting this and not that? And you're kind of getting the lay of the land first. You're surveying the topography of the of the subject. And then you find the, the point of entry. And then you see, you just expose yourself to an entire world. That you, just, you didn't see in the surface level. And you're involved in the commentaries and you're, you're kind of plunged into the discussions that the great medieval commentators had. You know, you're like, this is what the Ram was working through. Unbelievable. Like when you see the commentaries of the Rishonim, of the of the medieval commentators, and you and you 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 know what they're talking about because you understand the 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 basic layout. And now you found that portal and now you're involved in their discussions and you see like why are they disagreeing? Total Titans. They knew all of Talmud and all of Torah by heart. They have a very radically different way of understanding this piece of text in front of me. What is going on? And you've reached a level of consciousness that you know that there's, there's no there's no oversight here. It's not like, oh, he, he just forgot this, this other thing that I know, obviously. That doesn't happen. It never happens. When you're dealing with that level, there's none of that. So everything that you know, they knew. Yet they have a different conclusion. 
Now you've arrived at Talmud. Go figure out what happened over here. That's Talmud. And again, the hard, grinding work is all front-loaded. And the incredible pleasure of the achievements to understand that the payoff, the aha moment, is all back-loaded. And that's a problem with Talmud. That's why it's so hard. That's why it's a way to acquire Torah. If it was easy, everyone would do it. You have to power your way through a lot of really hard layers of rock. You need a lot of diligence to arrive at the Talmud. And it's hard. It's, it's mentally, it's emotionally draining. I remember when I was in yeshiva, you know, today, like, you could skip breakfast. I could skip breakfast. Eh, lunch. I'll get to it eventually. If you do, like, three, four hours of Talmud, you're, like, exhausted and starving. <laughs> it's only noon. It's one in the afternoon. Why? Because this this kind of exertion, it, it depletes all your all your, your calories. It's, a, it's an incredible amount of work. Your brain is a massive organ working really hard. You're watching television. Nothing. The brain activity is like nothing. <laughs> nothing going on there. You're pushing yourself to the, to the limits of what physiologically you're able to do. It's, it's draining and taxing. But of course, it's, it's just you're living like you're a human. You're not a human. Welcome. You're a human. You know, our tendency is to just favor those empty calories. We want to we wanna be mentally sedentary. That's what we want. If, if, if exercise is hard, ah, I don't want to bite today. I don't want to lift today. Oh, it's, I'm too lazy, right? You got to overcome laziness to do physical exercise, all the more so mental exercise, just monumentally hard. Instead, we'd rather just kick back our chair, drink our beer, and watch television to be physically and mentally inactive. Incidentally, how, how do you uh, accelerate this? If you look at the structure of the Talmud, it's all built in question and answer format, always. And the reason for this is because this is like a cheat code. There's a cheat code how to get to Talmud, and that is with questions, with arousing curiosity, with creating an imbalance, with creating an asymmetry, with, with causing a, a niggling problem in your brain. And your brain wants to resolve that. It wants to rid itself of the dissonance. And that's that's a way to kind of fast track your way into Talmud. And that's part of this. Part of this is to understand the structure of how your brain works and to understand how to accelerate your penetration of Talmud. And a part of this, of course, is curiosity about every area of life. And certainly when it comes to the will of Hashem. It's been pointed out, one of the first attributes you find about Moshe, of course, the absolute paragon of Torah, before he was selected, we noticed he had curiosity. Moshe's a shepherd, an unknown shepherd, forgotten about. And he travels with his sheep, and he sees the burning bush, and the bush is burning, but it's not being consumed, and he's curious about it. Lama lo yivar hasna. Why is the bush not being consumed? And he turns around to go investigate. And if you look at the verse, this is chapter 3 of Exodus. The verse says, and God saw that he turned to investigate and says, okay, I'm going to talk to him. Implied from this is that Moshe's curiosity about life was part of the reason why he was the best candidate to have the role that he had. He wasn't someone who just took things as a given. He was inquisitive, and that's part of the requirements to have Talmud and thus to have Torah. Now, this example might not be so relevant to many of y'all, but in the Dafyomi cycle, they just started now the book of Yuvamos, which is widely accepted to be one of the most difficult books of Talmud. And the way it starts, it, it to me, like just, it's just so fascinating the way the book starts. 
because the basic concept of Yavamos is that you know there are two brothers, one of them dies without any children. The second brother can marry the wife of the first brother, even though typically you're not allowed to marry your sister unless one of the prohibited relationships. In this particular instance, the first brother dies without any, any, any children. The second brother can marry in the form of Leverite marriage, as it's called, can marry the wife of his deceased brother. That's the basic idea. What about if the deceased brother had two wives? Well, then one of them, you can marry one of them, whichever one you choose. Well, what if the deceased brother has two wives and one of them happens to be a relative of yours? Very strange case. That's how the book of Yvama starts. Brother A is married to two women. One of the wives is the mother-in-law, the daughter, etc., of brother B. Just to note, you are allowed to marry your niece in Torah law, not your aunt. That's just the law. So brother A is married to two women. One of them is his niece, the daughter of brother B. And then brother A dies without any children. And of course, brother B cannot marry his own daughter. That would be prohibited. But can he marry the other woman who's not his daughter? And the answer is no. Because you are disqualified to marry one of the wives of your brother, you're also disqualified to marry the second one who is not really related to you. But then there's brother C. <laughs> and brother C is also married to a woman, and he marries not the wife that's the daughter of brother B, but the other wife. And then he does also without any children. And this is like your welcome to Yvamas moment. That's how it starts. Like, it plunges you right in to the deep end without any basic training. I mean, to me, like, this is like a master class in education. Like, you're like, you're starting with so many questions. Welcome to the book. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I hope you enjoy your stay. But the bottom line of the Talmud is that we have to remember that we are capable of immense, enormous things. The human brain is more advanced than any supercomputer, quantum computer. It's just more advanced. There are certain kinds of calculations that we can't do as fast, you know, mathematical calculations, etc. But what a human brain can produce, there's no amount of artificial intelligence that can match. And it improves with use. You buy a used car, and the older it is, the worse it is. The more it's withered, the more it's likely to break down, the more it's likely that parts of it are going to stop working, you'll have to do more more repairs. The more miles, the older it is, the worse it is. The brain gets stronger and more potent and sharper with use. It's like a muscle. So if you uh, want the Talmud, you have to recognize that. And therefore, a good pastime of course, the best pastime is to study Torah. But a good pastime is not just to watch soap operas, which deaden your brain, make it less potent, but do math problems or Sudoku even, or Wordle. <laughs> Wordle. I don't know if that's the little thing. I don't know if that's the little thing. Chess. Chess or Go or something like that. Push your brain to be active. Think a little bit until you feel a little pain. Your brain needs to relax because it didn't work out. That means that you are exercising this incredible muscle. Learn about this superpower. Yetzar wants you to be on TikTok, watching television, quick dopamine hits of scrolling Instagram. We've met people, I'm sure all of y'all have, who pride themselves, oh, I never read. I never read. All they're saying is, that they are neglecting their superpower. You have something that's unmatched by anything else in this world. This brain with like trillions of synapses and all these firing stuff, just incredible. And you're like, ah, I just, I just rather scroll my phone. We've got to fight back. We have to recognize that we have the superpower. we got to develop it and use it. And again, one great way to fast track it the cheat code is to ask questions. And I would add, maybe this is more basic to the general principle of, of the four, 48 ways, part of the kind of study being discussed here is when it ceases to be academic. 
When the learning becomes alive within you, because it's resonating within you, that's Talmud. You're not just studying it at a distance, arm's length. Let me just see what uh, it says over here. It's becoming alive within you. This is not repeating old and boring tropes and platitudes. This is not a soporific sermon. This is the kind of learning that gets to the depths of who you are as a person, and it fundamentally changes you. My grandfather, bless him, I used to always say that the biggest difference between Torah giants and the greats of the nations, we acknowledge that there are greats amongst the nations. There were giants. Socrates and, and Plato and Pliny and, uh, of course, Aristotle. These were giants. And throughout history, there have been greats amongst the nations. And of course, every generation, we have Torah greats as well. The primary difference is that in Torah, everything that you study, you adopt and you integrate. There can be no delta, no daylight, no window between what you learn, and what you know, and how you behave. The art, of course, is symbolic of Torah. It's got to be gold inside and outside. There has to be knowledge that actually transforms you. And that's part of this idea. When you're studying Torah at this level, you're, you're actually acquiring it. It's yours. It's not just something that you have in a file folder that you could summon. You could do a pull request on this file. Something which is actually now melded and integrated and synthesized with who you are. My grandfather in his later years used to give a, a weekly lecture in Torah. Musser, it was a lecture that he gave every week, but he would do it three times in three different locations, the same lecture. Now you would think, you would think that the second time you gave it, it's even easier than the first time you've done it before. Third time, even easier. But he used to say that it's actually harder and harder. Because there's the danger of you just repeating what you said but not actually living it. The first time is the easiest to do it because then it's more, most alive within you. The second time you do it, it's a little bit harder because now there is the risk of you just relying on what you did last time and repeating yourself and paying lip service to this idea and not living the Torah. And that is the Talmud. It's a kind of study that you become deeply, fundamentally, intimately connected to. You're enraptured by what you study. And you dedicate yourself to it. And it forever changes your life. And it will be a portal for you to have Torah. And it's the first of the 48 ways. One down. 47 to go. I am looking forward to doing this. I don't know if we'll do, each one will be its own episode, or we'll bunch them together, we'll see. But we have one down, and 47 to go, from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This was a delight to study with y'all today. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions and your comments.